Welcome to The Brief Therapist with Tom Skatidis. Our podcast is dedicated to making psychotherapy accessible to everyone. In this series, Tom shares evidence-based psychotherapy strategies designed to improve mental health for individuals, enhance couples' relationships, and repair family conflict. Whatever mental health or relationship challenges you're facing, The Brief Therapist with Tom Skatidis offers the insights and tools you need to cope effectively and thrive. This podcast is provided solely for educational and informational purposes and is not intended as a substitute for professional advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of qualified health providers regarding any mental health or relationship concerns you may have. Welcome to The Brief Therapist with Tom Skatidis. I'm Tom Skatidis and today's episode is around the reality of fat shaming. And I'm joined today by Dr. Sarah Teja Sukmana. Welcome, doctor. Would you like to introduce yourself? I'm a specialist GP here in Sydney. I work with a lot of eating disordered patients and I particularly offer weight neutral, weight inclusive care that aligns with the health at every size principles. That's great to have you here, Dr. Sarah. Thank you. I wanted to start today by offering a definition for shame and fat shaming and fat shame. And feel free to jump in with your own thoughts. For me, the the core of fat shaming is shame, which in my work is a biological emotion, an evolutionary emotion. Essentially, it's when we feel fundamentally flawed or defective in comparison to others, and therefore we don't belong. We're outcasts. It's a pretty painful emotion. For me, fat shaming are the behaviors that one shows toward another that causes that feeling of shame to rise in the other. Or when we experience that ourselves, when we're comparing ourselves to others or to current societal standards of health and beauty. Uh, What are your thoughts on those definitions, doctor? They definitely make sense to me. I think you're right that shame is very much an evolutionary thing as well that we need to fit into the group. So we have a drive to actually belong and not just to be different. So it's very important for us to head in that direction. It's about survival. Yeah. In those ancient times, if we weren't part of that tribe. You'd get left behind. That's right. Shame is a very intimate, intense experience of feeling that that defectiveness. And unfortunately, that sense of defectiveness, that sense of defectiveness, of course. And unfortunately, the behaviors of fat shaming can cause that to to take place within us. In your practice, do you work with patients who are experiencing fat shaming? Very much so. And those patients are actually across the weight spectrum as well. When you say fat shaming, people are automatically going to be thinking of people in what they consider to be larger bodies. And obviously I do see those people. And especially as a weight neutral, weight inclusive doctor, they sometimes specifically seek me out because they trust me not to fat shame them. But equally, as someone who works with eating disorders, I work with people who are actually what we would call severely underweight, who still feel fat shame because they still feel as though their body is not what it was meant to be, which fits with your idea that the shame is about a sense of defectiveness, not an actual objective problem. Let's talk about your patients and the impacts the fat shaming is having on their uh, cognitive and emotional and behavioral health. A lot of patients that I see who are in larger bodies, when they eventually come to me, it's the first time they've seen a doctor in years because they've spent years going to the doctor and everything is focused on their weight. Um, You can go to the doctor with a sore wrist and be told if your wrist is sore and you just lose weight that your wrist is going to get better. And so there comes a point where they stop going to the doctor because they do feel that shame. We know there is evidence that there is delayed diagnosis in patients in larger bodies because healthcare professionals have a tendency to look at them and just see the weight and therefore ignore symptoms that they should be paying more attention to. We also know that obviously the shame leads to other psychological problems, so it's very much implicated with anxiety and depression and those sorts of disorders and also obviously can lead to eating disorders 
And again, not just the very skinny teenage girl that you think of when I say anorexia, but the large number of patients that I see with what we call atypical anorexia who are in larger bodies but are in these awful cycles of restriction. And this means that they're starving themselves. How is this affecting their brain? They're not nourishing their body. They're not nourishing their brain because they have felt shame both externally and internally so much that they feel that they have to do this to change that body shape, to be what they think they need to be. And to go with that as well, the same behaviours that are a problem that we are horrified by in someone that we perceive as skinny, we actually praise in the fat person. And this comes back to your shame definition. Uh, We have this concept in the larger body community where we talk about a good fatty. And so when a person is in that larger body and they have that sense of shame, that they want to be the good fatty. So they go out to lunch with their friends and they order the salad. Not because they want the salad, but because they want to be seen to be doing what is quote unquote the right thing. And if they sit there and they pick at their salad and they barely eat, almost no one is going to look at them and say, hey, baby, you okay? You didn't actually have lunch today. They're just going to think, oh, look at her. She's doing really well trying to lose that weight. Ordering that salad when you actually wanted something more robust, something different. Completely flies in the face of intuitive eating, nourishing your body, nourishing your brain, giving your body what it needs. And even though you are present with your friends or your family when you're eating that salad, it is actually a micro form of social withdrawal. Because if everyone else is eating a hearty lunch, big plates of food, and salad is a side item, if you're having that salad only, then that to me is a form of withdrawal, even if you are physically present. A lot of people who do this would then tell you that they're thinking about the food the entire time. Whether they're thinking, are they noticing what I'm eating? Are they thinking good things about what I'm eating? Are they judging me for it? Or they might be having those thoughts of, wow, I really wanted that burger and that burger looks amazing. And so they're feeling that sense of grief and loss that they couldn't just listen to their body that day and their body wanted a burger. That's right. Back to the disordered eating that you mentioned. To me as a psychotherapist, that feels as if it's a way to gain control over one's life. And when I work with clients who have disordered eating, um, disrupted eating patterns, I find that there is a general feeling of lack of control in their lives. And where they do have control is when and what and how much of it they eat. To me, someone who has been fat shamed is experiencing a sense of not belonging or a sense of defectiveness, not having control over their ability to belong, and therefore a disordered eating approach or disrupted eating approach is one way to feel as if I can control something in my life as opposed to being out of control, out of the tribe. This is a step toward me claiming some power. Of course, that control is usually detrimental to their organic health. Definitely. We often say to people that eating disorders serve a function. It's a maladaptive function, but they serve a function. And sometimes until we work out what that underlying purpose is and actually deal with that, and that's often somewhere that someone like yourself comes in dealing with whatever that trauma or shame or background is that led to them using this maladaptive approach to try and get more control. The key is to help my clients gain a sense of control and self-mastery over themselves and their bodies using other tools, other behaviors that are also healthy for them. And it can be very liberating for these patients to realize that actually listening to their internal body cues and honoring their body cues is in some ways control. They can actually say, I'm not going to give in to this shame. I'm not going to give in to the messaging that I'm getting from the outside world that says that there's something wrong with my body and that there's a certain way that 
I should be starving it or over exercising it or something like that. And they can actually just say the control that I have here is to say, actually, my body is beautiful and I'm going to listen to my hunger cues and I'm going to nourish my body. But it can be difficult because the voices in their heads, which in most cases are not theirs, but installed by caregivers or close friends or extended family. What are some of the inner critic statements or expressions that your patients share with you in terms of their fat shame? The inner critic does tend to come out with the concept of that there is something wrong with them, that they don't belong, that they have a low worth, and often a sense of blame as well for them, that they've got this idea that not only is there something wrong with their body, but whatever is supposedly wrong with their body is their fault. They must have been too lazy, too greedy. They've done this to themselves. And then on the flip side, obviously, the inner critic then says, you could actually fix this. If you really wanted this, you could fix it. Obviously, in many cases, they don't. And then the self-blame increases. Well, the issue there is that if we come back to what we know about weight science is it's not just that they don't, but that they can't. That's right. I mean, there's the firstly the argument about the fact that the body is not the problem in the first place. We have very high quality level A evidence that shows that diets do not work. We actually have very minimal control over our body size. A lot of it comes down to genetics. A lot of it comes down to socioeconomic status. And these are the sorts of things that we don't have control over. You want to share some of the research that you've come across in terms of some of the myths that exist around body size, diets, exercise? Society in general and medicine has traditionally had a very weight-centric focus. Weight is something that you can just see. So although it can be measured, there are a variety of ways to measure a person's size. We don't have to, you know, I look at you right now, Tom, and I have got no idea what your blood pressure is like unless I actually test it. I've got no idea what your cholesterol is like. I've got no idea what your sugars are like, but I can see a body and therefore I can make assumptions about that body. And traditionally speaking, we have made assumptions that weight is in and of itself a marker of health. Weight is neither indicative of health, nor is it indicative of a person's actual behaviours, such as what they eat or how they exercise. Have you come across that? Absolutely. I, I subscribe to the health at every size philosophy. And I can tell you that personally, based on the BMI measurement, I actually am overweight. Insurance companies having told me when I'm getting life insurance or income protection insurance that I exceed the BMI and therefore they have to add a premium. What's interesting though is all of my bloods and other biomarkers are excellent. The BMI itself is probably a topic for an entirely separate podcast. Long story short, it is incredibly arbitrary. The history of it is fascinating but terrible and it really should be thrown out the window. To return, however, just to things that we can measure, there are some studies out of America that show that if you look at all-cause mortality across, now they do use BMI ranges because the one time that a BMI is useful is to arbitrarily put people in different groups for research, they look at what they call healthy habits. Now they look at habits of, do you eat five serves of fruit and veg a day? Do you exercise at least 12 times a month? They didn't even look at what constituted exercise. They weren't saying a certain amount of hours or a certain intensity, just 12 incidences of exercise a month. Do you not smoke? And do you drink a moderate amount of alcohol? There's a scientific reason for that. People who don't drink at all are statistically more likely to die than people who drink just that one or two glasses a day sort of thing. So they were looking for people in that sweet spot from an alcohol perspective. And then they looked at all-cause mortality. They followed almost 12,000 people. So this is a very high-powered study. What they found was that, yes, if you were someone who had none of those healthy habits, so you don't eat your fruit and veg, you don't exercise, and you're a smoker, you either don't drink any alcohol or you drink way too much, then in that subset of people, 
the larger bodied people were more likely to die from yeah. anything than the smaller bodied people. But by the time you get out to three or four of those healthy habits, there was no statistical difference between the different BMI groups. And so what that means is that a supposedly fat person who has healthy habits can be healthy. They also have done studies into body size and diet quality. And they can tell you from those studies that most of us have pretty terrible diet quality, actually, regardless of our body size, but that again, the quality of your diet does not discriminate with your body size. So for all those people who are telling us that you are what you eat, they are wrong. In the very least, this research you're sharing provides a strong reason to continue looking into what we believe is true yes. and challenge that and produce new research that will help us understand what the actual truth is. Alongside that, we have evidence obviously then about the damage caused by weight stigma. A lot of people in larger bodies essentially end up on the dieting pipeline. And what we see traditionally there obviously is people would refer to it as a yo-yo diet or we refer to this in, in sort of medicine and the literature as weight cycling. And so that is the concept that you are a certain weight, you go on a diet, you lose weight. At some point you plateau. Now, you plateau for evolutionary reasons. Your body doesn't know that we're currently living in the beautiful city of Sydney with food on every corner and I can eat anytime I want. If I starve my body, my body is thinking 6,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer, this is a famine. There's not enough food. And it sees that trajectory of weight loss and it starts to panic. And it thinks, if I keep going in that direction... I'm going to die. It makes a variety of metabolic and hormonal changes in order to slow down that weight loss because it wants to hold on until the next time it's able to feed properly again. What we then know is that as well as affecting that individual instance of dieting, some of those changes are more sustained. Your body makes changes thinking, if we have a famine like this again, how am I going to ensure that I don't die next time? And so what it does is it changes things like your insulin resistance so that you can store fat more effectively because it thinks I better stack stuff away for next time. And so the typical thing that a larger body person who has been on a diet is that the first diet was amazing, supposedly amazing, because it felt like it worked in the sense that they wanted to lose weight, they start the diet, they get a fast weight loss, and then they plateaued. And then they start to put the weight back on again. And almost always they go back to a weight that's higher than the weight that they'd initially started at. And at this point, doctor, and I work with clients who've shared similar stories with me, there's a feeling of failure. And that feeds into that narrative of shame. If you just do it better next time, next time it will work and you will get that longitudinal weight loss. The problem is every time we do this, it gets harder to lose the weight and then you put more weight on out the other side. What we also know is aside from the fact that that's obviously counterproductive for what that person supposedly wanted, is that the weight cycling in and of itself, regardless of the start weight and the end weight, just that act of going up and down, up and down, up and down over years, that increases all-cause mortality. That increases rates of type 2 diabetes. That increases heart disease. It increases cholesterol because of the way it increases the insulin resistance right. in order to store things more appropriately. And also issues with blood sugar levels in the sense that the aim of the body in general is is what we call homeostasis. And that, that's just that nice idea that we have this sort of little box that we sit in where we've got a certain range of blood pressure and a certain range of heart rate and a certain temperature. We should also have a certain level of blood sugar. Now, if you eat regularly and adequately as you are meant to, your body's pretty good. 
at balancing a fairly normal blood sugar. If you alternate between starving and either eating normally or even binging, because binging is the body's natural response to significant restriction, then you alternate between a really low blood sugar where your body is having to mobilise fat stores to try and deal with it to flipping into the opposite direction. That's not good for you. I want to talk about psychotherapy strategies now that can help your clients, my clients, and anyone listening or watching this podcast to manage and overcome fat shame. And for those who have fat shamed others, strategies to help them understand, why am I doing that? You mentioned research and a lot of it is mind blowing. In my practice in psychotherapy, I call that psychoeducation. It's psychological education. And that often is curative in itself is when you present new information to people that can be paradigm shifting, mind blowing. Um, it gives them hope, which can act as an offset against their distress. Psychoeducation is in itself a critical psychotherapy strategy. I know that you've inspired me to share more of that through this podcast and through my newsletter. And I encourage you to keep educating your clients about research like this. The second strategy I want to discuss is core values. How do you overcome fat shame or fat shaming if it's a behavior? One way is to find something that you believe in so deeply that is bigger than yourself. For example, some of my clients say, well, I believe in fairness and justice for everyone. I was going to say inclusivity, just that idea that people should be able to live their lives and people have a right yes. to have equal health care. When you find a principle that you're willing to work so hard for, uh, even past exhaustion, that is a core value. I'm just wondering, in terms of yourself, is there a core value that you have that enables you to overcome any fat shame you've experienced yourself? Humans have worth and dignity regardless of their body size. You should not have to fight for equality just because you live in a differently sized body to somebody else that somebody else has put a judgment on. And that comes both from the healthcare perspective in that sense of you should be able to go to a doctor and say, I have these symptoms and be listened to and be treated appropriately. I often say to my colleagues, if I had a BMI of 22, would you be giving me the same advice? And if the answer from the healthcare professional is, well, no, then why? What makes that the core value and the hill that I will very happily die on is I don't want other people to have experiences that I have had. I want to take my trauma and my pain right, and actually make a difference so that other people don't have to go through that. With my clients' core values as well, like psychoeducation, especially in combination with psychoeducation, can be curative because when you've identified those principles that are bigger than who you are and you believe in, I think something changes within you. There's a clicking motion that takes place and suddenly you see the world through hope and through strength. It's liberating. There is sometimes a misunderstanding in the community that if we say health at every size, that we mean everybody is healthy. It means that regardless of your body size, you have a right to health care. And what we want to focus on is aiming to increase your health. Even discussing health is actually a very privileged and ableist place for us to be. A large amount of our health, not just body size that we're already talking about, is out of our control. I may have something to do with my health if I am a lifelong heavy smoker and I get lung cancer. But there are a large number of cancers, again, that are related to my genetics, that are related to my socioeconomic status, that are related maybe to exposures in my childhood that we didn't even know were a problem at the time. If you take things like asbestosis, for example, we shouldn't be judging people 
on their health. We shouldn't be expecting them to be better and do better on their health. You're a psychoeducation warrior, doctor. I would say that a very large amount of my consult time is spent myth-busting. Another psychotherapy strategy I want to discuss, doctor, is awareness of our unconscious holds. I want to give you an example. When we're children, when we are crying through pain, through sadness or fear, and a parent or a caregiver shuts down that emotion by saying, stop crying, usually the child, in most cases, because of a need to belong and survival needs, will shut down or try to shut down that primary emotion. And will learn that that's not an emotion that they're allowed to have, not an emotion that they're allowed to share, and will then develop maladaptive processes in order to hide these things. But that process of shutting down your fear or shame or sadness to please the caregiver is actually adaptive as a child because it's focusing on surviving. If that adaptive behavior happens hundreds or thousands of times, the body learns and the mind learns how to adapt in an instant. What is adaptive as a child to ensure its survival becomes maladaptive in adulthood. It is imperative to understand that when you are fat shaming another, you must in the very least pause and reflect on the question, why? What am I doing here? What am I so scared of that I feel the need to put this other person down and hold them to some arbitrary ideal that I've got? When you learn to shut down your own primary emotions, What happens is the way you shut down your emotions is you call up a belief. It becomes a vehicle to escape the primary emotion in an elegant manner. For example, with fat shaming, the fat shamer may have experienced it as a, as a child or witnessed it, felt an incredibly painful fear or sadness at witnessing it, learned to shut it down. To protect itself or was forced to shut it down if the parent said stop crying about it they deserved that fat shaming how do you then move past that bring up a belief which is it's because they're lazy and that belief is a valid way to escape the primary experience but the belief then creates a secondary emotion which is usually anger or contempt so for me the fat shamer almost always is acting out of anger or contempt or anxiety, which is a secondary emotion, which is really not what we should be looking at. I'm interested is what is your primary emotion and when did that form and how did you learn to shut it down? I've had multiple online interactions with keyboard warriors who love to troll when uh, there is a conversation about body positivity, health at every size. They come along and they make accusations of your glorifying obesity or larger body size. We try not to use the word obesity, but that's the word that they will use. If you actually do engage with them and they do come back at you with, I'm just worried for their health. The rescuing behaviour. Yes, the rescuing behavior. It's great to have them say that because that gives us something that we can anchor onto and then challenge because then we can say, well, here is the evidence that says it's not going to be a problem for their health necessarily. So what are you worried about now? For many, that might work, but for many, they might just dismiss it summarily in the presence of what they perceive as greater research. And for those people... I'm interested in what is literally happening under the hood. I would say that's the fear that they're not comfortable sitting with. It's a form of projection in in psychotherapy. Anytime you disown a quality of yours because owning it would seriously harm your self-image, your self-esteem, you disown it by projecting it like a movie projector onto someone else or a group of people And that allows you to not 
experience that emotion, but blame others for it. It's a survival mechanism to avoid damage to one's self-concept. For the argument about whether or not body size is an issue, that's actually a load of rubbish because it's got nothing to do with whether or not body size is an issue. What it comes back down to is social justice and inclusion. I don't want you, whoever you are, to be uncomfortable in an airplane. Now, I haven't specified here if I'm talking to the fat person or the keyboard warrior, because the point is I don't want either of them to be uncomfortable in an airplane. Now, I do appreciate that the person who has just realised that they're sitting next to someone who doesn't actually fit properly in that seat may find that their space is encroached upon and they may feel uncomfortable. And I'm sorry for them that that happens. Can we also talk, though, about what's happening to the larger bodied person there who is physically uncomfortable because the company has not provided them with an adequately sized seat. And so the core problem here is not the size of that person's body, but the way the airline has made the seats. We're doing such a good job in many places in society of trying to make things more accessible. We like to put in ramps, we like to put in lifts or other ways to get wheelchairs in where we're finally starting to notice that people who are differently abled in terms of, say, whether or not they walk or use a wheelchair need access. People of different body sizes, and yes, that includes the really tall people or the really short people, may need different help. It's not fair that the seats are not made for fat people. If the argument is, well, they should have controlled their eating, body size is not controllable or at the very least very difficult to control. I, I read a study that that even with exercise, it might have short-term results, but often people will, will go back to a state of homeostasis. To be fair there too, Tom, when I use the term dieting, I'm using dieting as an umbrella term to cover all forms of attempt, really, to, to change body size, because all of it comes down to a very archaic concept of calories in versus calories out. The idea being, if my calories in is less than my calories out, there should be a net loss. That's the idea that all of this goes by. Now, sometimes that is traditional dieting in the sense of eating less in general or calorie counting or eating less of a certain type if we're talking about keto or people who do things like intermittent fasting. Exercise is still a diet in the sense of if you're exercising to try and lose weight. Exercise is great in and of itself. That is important for your mental health. It is important for decreasing diabetes, decreasing heart disease. But if you're exercising more than you're eating, then you're still trying to induce that calorie deficit. And equally, bariatric surgery is a healthcare-imposed diet they're making it not possible for you to eat what you used to eat. It's incredibly mind-blowing idea to think about how what we're talking about here can start shifting societal standards of health and beauty. And to go with that as well, obviously one of the biggest things we get asked these days is people walk in and they say, can I get that medication for weight loss? It's a diet. It's a pharmaceutical diet, but it's a diet. And the weight loss companies and the companies that make things like the gastric balloons that can be used in bariatric surgery, they have a conflict of interest here. The science coming out of those companies comes with a significant amount of bias and conflict of interest. It is in their best interest to keep us pathologizing weight because then they can sell us $400 a month injections. It's a system focus on pathologizing weight, not just those companies, but most Multiple. of the system. I want to share a fourth psychotherapy strategy. And this one is close to my heart because it forms a big part of my own psychotherapy practice. It's basically simulated dialogue. The term that I use in my practice is chair work. The purpose of chair work is to set up uh, multiple chairs for my clients, and in those chairs place either a part of themselves that represents the distressing part. For example, the inner critic that blames them for being 
a failure at controlling their weight or eating too much. In another chair, we might actually put a fat shamer, someone who in childhood or even a week ago caused them to feel fat shame based on how they, they were spoken to. In that experiential simulated dialogue, because the fat shamer isn't actually in the chair, and the part of you that blames you isn't actually in the chair, but it's an imaginary approach, it's a simulated one, have that dialogue and actually express a cycle of emotions, many of which you're not even aware of. You can express the shame that that part of you has caused you or the fat shamer has caused you. You can express sadness. You can express fear. You can even express anger. It is through that expression of emotions that they start to light up and feel things that they probably haven't been feeling or not aware of. And in doing so, a lot of their rumination and thoughts start to collapse because for me, emotion first, cognition second, or emotion first, thought second. If you work on the emotions, the thoughts usually start coming in place. I'll also have my clients switch chairs and be that part of them that blames them or be the fat shamer as well. And it, effectively, it's a simulated dialogue that's either one way or two ways. Now, that's a, it's a confronting exercise. I don't recommend doing it on your own. But with the presence of a trained healthcare professional or a psychotherapist, it can actually produce a lot of peace because things that have never been said, never been shared, or the client's not aware of are now public or present. There's nothing like speaking out loud to make it real. I have had similar experiences with some of my patients in that almost everyone has an inner critic. And with the eating disordered patients in, in particular, we do talk about the ED voice. The ED voice. The eating disorder often has a voice. And some of our patients, we even name the eating disorder voice. And we can actually go through like, you know, who is, is, is that your voice? Is it someone else's voice? And there are times in consultation with a patient where we will talk about that. If you know your patient reasonably well, you can see when they switch. You're having a nice conversation. You make a comment about eating more regularly and out comes the sass that you weren't expecting. And you say, oh, there's the inner critic. There's the eating disorder voice. And as you start to call this out to your patient, not to shame them, not to put them down for it, but just to make them more aware of it and to say, like, I can see that something that I've just said here has actually triggered a part of your brain that is maladaptively trying to protect you. What's your eating disorder voice worried about when I said, I want you to start having breakfast? And then they're often able to start realising too that concept of those different parts in their brain and they start, or some of them start to be able to find it themselves and they say, oh, that's the eating disorder voice today is really telling me that this is going to happen. That's right. And we have to remember that a lot of those voices that we hear that blame us or critique us are probably not our own organic voices, but ones that have been installed through our childhood that we swallowed whole back then. You know, today, if someone says a comment to me that is not pleasant, I will chew on that comment and probably spit out 97% of it. And I might keep 3%. But as kids, we don't have that cognitive filter or emotional awareness to spit out what our parents tell us. We swallow it whole. And as a result, those voices can seem as if they are us. They are organic and therefore the shame when in reality, we have to simulate dialogue and through that, start to realize, well, actually, that's what mom used to say or dad used to say, or that's what my primary school teachers used to say, and start having those aha moments where we're distancing ourselves from what we thought was us, when in reality, you know, that's trauma. And as you point out as well, those places that we got those voices are often either or both people who loved us or who were supposed to love us or we believed loved us or and or 
people of authority. So as you say, we're talking about parents, we're talking about school teachers, we're talking about doctors. If the doctor told me I had to lose weight, well, I mean, they're a doctor. They should know, right? And I do believe that in the future we are going to look back and we're going to say we can't believe that we fat shamed people and that we put them through starvation and that we didn't give them adequate health care and that we didn't look after them in society because we perceived this as some sort of detrimental personal fault that they were that size. And I hope that this episode serves as a building block toward that society. The more we talk about it, the more we change it. Yes. Thank you so much for today. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Brief Therapist with Tom Skatidis. We hope you have benefited from our insights on improving mental health for individuals, enhancing couples' relationships, and repairing family conflict. To stay connected and never miss an episode, click the follow button on your podcast app. You can also share your thoughts with a review to help others find us. And if you'd like more information on Tom Skatidis or his psychotherapy practice, Intermind, please visit www.intermind.com.au.